Hello and welcome to The Conversation Weekly. This week, when war breaks out, what does it mean to remain neutral? We explore the advantages and disadvantages of neutrality and what responsibilities come with the choice not to take sides. We spoke with an historian about how an age of neutrality emerged in the 19th century and the lessons it has for the war in Ukraine. I would argue that British power was dependent on this policy of neutrality in Europe. And we ask a foreign policy expert about why one country in particular, India, is staying neutral over Ukraine. India is not saying we have nothing to do with the conflict, but it's very proactive. I'm Dan Marino in San Francisco. And I'm Gemma Ware in London. You're listening to The Conversation Weekly, the world explained by experts. Dan, I want to show you a list. I'm sending you this link. Can you click on it? Okay. Clicking. And then scroll down. Can you see that big black box? Yes, I can. Okay. So describe what you're seeing. All right. So I'm looking at a big black box with a list of countries, mostly green pluses saying in favor uh, five against in red. This is Syria, Russia, North Korea, Eritrea, and Belarus. So this is a list of how different countries voted on a vote on the 2nd of March at the UN General Assembly on a resolution demanding that Russia stops its offensive in Ukraine and immediately withdraw all its troops. As you said, there are five countries that voted against this resolution and 141 countries voted for it, but there were 35 countries that abstained. Uh, and so tell us some of these countries. Uh, looks like a nice smattering of countries. There's Algeria and Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Namibia, El Salvador, India, Iran, Iraq, uh, China. Oh, China also was abstaining here. Um, a lot of countries, though, none of the quote unquote big Western powers, so to speak. Exactly. And all these countries abstained on this vote at the UN General Assembly. And by doing so, they've essentially chosen to remain neutral on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I imagine China, which chose to stay neutral, has very different reasons for doing so than, say, a country like Senegal. And it seems like this is probably a very case-by-case basis. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And for this episode, I've actually been finding out that this is something that's been happening throughout history. Countries that choose to remain neutral really have to weigh up the pros and cons of doing so very carefully. And you really have to understand the dynamics in that country. So in this episode, we're actually going to zoom right down into one country in particular to find out what's going on and about its decision to remain neutral. And that country is India. India's position on Ukraine crisis, uh, as I view it, I have called it a proactive neutrality, which means India would not be comfortable taking any one of the sides in the conflict, either to stand with Russia completely or to stand with United States and its friends and allies. This is Swaran Singh. He's a professor of diplomacy and disarmament at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, where he studies India's foreign policy. And I called him up to find out why India has remained neutral on Ukraine. India is not saying we have nothing to do with the conflict, but it's very proactive. A good example of it would be how, unlike most other countries, India was one unique country that decided to rescue about 22,500 Indian nationals in the middle of the war in Ukraine. And not only Indians, uh, India also decided and managed to rescue 147 other nationals out of the war zone. India has launched a massive evacuation plan. It's called Operation Ganga, under which about 46 flights will fly out Indian nationals. And that reflected a very close and intense engagement of India's diplomacy, both with Moscow and Kiev. So India's focus was to bring relief to begin with to Indian nationals on the ground. And of course, since then, India has been constantly involved in sending whatever India can uh, or humanitarian assistance to people on the ground. Uh, so India has uh, made a distinction of working at two levels. One, being in constant conversation with all the parties, whether it is uh, President Joe Biden or it is President Putin or President Zelensky and several European leaders and of course China, Japan and others, uh, basically ensuring if India can contribute to the early cessation of violence and early beginning of direct dialogue. 
but without waiting for that to happen india has constantly been focused on ensuring the world draws attention on what is happening in terms of death and destruction on the ground every day in ukraine and uh, contribute to whatever humanitarian assistance india can do on the ground so india has therefore been very proactive but nevertheless neutral uh, on ukraine crisis and why has india remained neutral on the ukraine crisis what i today call proactive neutrality uh, actually is rooted very deeply in india's tradition of non alignment which itself was a result of india's kind of liberation struggle collapse of uh, colonial empires decolonization uh, and it grew from there with that sense of a new generation of national leaders across asia africa and latin america uh, coming together with a new vision and therefore to begin with they had their first meeting of about 29 heads of uh, state in Indonesia in Bandung conference in 1955 uh, which is where they developed this new sense of uh, afro asian movement and later they also expanded and met again as a formal non aligned movement in 1961 in belgrade and in belgrade they actually created a criterion of what would qualify for any country to become a member of non aligned movement and that showcases that it was not completely avoiding participation in international affairs but simply saying that they will steer clear from military alliances of east and west but nevertheless continue with their struggle and and support national liberation movements self determination opposition to apartheid was one great issue for all of them so it was a very proactive approach in non alignment only thing is it was anchored in cold war context and when cold war came to an end there was a discussion as to what happens to non alignment it is still there of course but india meanwhile also has emerged as as a one of the major countries it's, it's no longer seen as a third world uh, least developed country now and in that sense india has since then moved from non alignment to multi alignments which is where india is trying to build uh, uh, partnerships with as many countries as possible in that sense the multi alignment now explains why india is perfectly at home being uh, perhaps one of the maybe only country where uh, all parties to conflict uh, are finding themselves at comfort with india but also at the same time not most pleased because india is not siding with any of them so you know all of them are trying to push and nudge india to take their side but india has continued to be proactive and neutral because that is what india's foreign policy culturally civilizationally and politically has been all the time and it also means india has done cost benefit analysis and it feels that that proactive neutrality ensures maximum benefits with minimum costs maximum benefits with minimum costs well that sure sounds like a good deal but i got to imagine that's a pretty tricky balancing act to pull off in the complicated world of international relations It really is. And um, we're going to hear more from Swaran Singh about what that actually means for India and its relationship with Russia and the West and in particular the United States a bit later in this episode. But first of all, what do you imagine when I say neutral in the context of a war? Well, as an American, my brain immediately goes to World War 1 and World War 2 where the United States really tried not to get involved in the wars until we didn't really have a choice. But today it seems much more complicated. Yeah, we don't have troops in Ukraine right now, but we're sending guns and money and all this stuff. So, I don't know. It's kind of this tricky blurry line it feels like. That blurry definition of what neutrality means today in the context of Ukraine versus what it used to mean back in say the 19th century is a really interesting question. And I called up a historian who's an expert on neutrality to find out more. My name's Matcha Abanos. I'm a professor in modern history at Waipapa Taumata Rao, which is the University of Auckland. And I specialize in the history of really broadly war, peace, neutrality and international norms mainly in the long 19th century and the First World War era. Why is this history, this history of neutrality that that you've spent your career studying? Um why is it important to understanding this moment we're in now, this reaction globally that different parts of the world are having to the Russian invasion of Ukraine? For me, it's this moment there is a war between two distinct 
countries. We have Russia and we have Ukraine and everyone else is not taking part as a belligerent. It's not fighting this war militarily, even if it's supplying military materials or money or support in other ways. And that is by my definition, the definition of what it is to be neutral. In order to be able to study neutrality over time, you need a very broad definition of what it is to be non-belligerent, not fighting when others are. And so if you say, let's look at this war through the lens of what the countries, the states, the governments, the people who are not officially at war, what they're doing, what they're thinking, how they're portraying this, what are their fears and worries, how are they moralizing this. It opens up space for us to ask really important questions about what it is that we value, what it is that we want to see happen, how can we bring the conflict to a close faster, what responsibilities really do we, the neutral world, take for war. I want to understand a bit about the history of of neutrality. Um, So when did the concept of neutrality first emerge um, and why? I think the choice to not go to war has probably existed since there were communities that used violence to try to exact something from each other or territories or space or rights or privileges, etc. And in all warfare, there have always been groups, states, governments that have tried to carve out a space for themselves, for their own protection and safety, to not take part, to uh, remove themselves from conflict. So it's pretty much a constant. However, when we talk about neutrality today in international setting, it's something that has a very formal history. It's related to international laws of war, which of course very European inspired and, and influenced. By the time you get to the early modern period in Europe, you get a real discourse around this. There's debates about the rights of uh, states and governments not to take part in war. So, you know, Machiavelli says, no, no, nobody wants a neutral in a war because you can't be trusted by the winners, the conquerors, because you didn't stand with them and you won't be trusted by the defeated because you didn't help defend them. So there's no space for neutrality in that kind of world. But by the 17th century, you have Hugo Grotius, who's a very famous international lawyer of the time and continues to be quite important in international law today, talking about the fact that, yes, you can be neutral when others kings or princes go to war with each other, but you have to stick to very strict rules. So you can't trade unequally. So you have to be impartial in your conduct between the warring parties. The notion of claiming neutrality becomes more standardized through the 18th century. So once the United States becomes a country in the late 18th century, Uh, And that the outbreak of the French Revolutionary Wars, Thomas Jefferson stands up and says, the United States is not taking part in any war in Europe. We don't care about your revolutions. We're a new state. We're weak. We declare ourselves neutral. And so by the time we hit the 19th century, we have an expansion of neutral governments claiming rights. So we have a right to the open seas. If I'm a neutral, no privateer, no pirate can seize my cargo at sea because I'm flying a flag from a country that's not taking part in this war. In this period in the 19th century, when more and more countries were claiming neutrality, what did it actually mean to be neutral? So after the Napoleonic Wars, so from about 1815 on, there were three ways to be neutral. And this is where it gets complicated because neutrality is not just a choice not to go to war. It can also be an assigned status that international society gives a country or a territory or even a canal. So Switzerland was neutralized in 1815 by agreement of the great powers. Belgium was neutralized in the 1830s after its secession from the Netherlands by agreement of the great European powers. The Suez Canal is neutralized in the 1860s in order to allow all states 
to use it for their ships as long as they pay a fee to the canal company. Neutralization becomes more common as a way of removing certain pieces of land, territory, people, resources from competition. So that's the first one. So it's a kind of treaty based. Yeah, the easy one, the neutralized one, the treaty based one. And then there were two other ways to be neutral, one of which was voluntary neutrality. So these were states and countries, usually small ones, but not always small ones. The United States was a rather large power and it pretty much adopted this foreign policy choice. You assert to the world, we don't intend to go to war with anyone. We will have a military, but that military is only there to defend our borders and our trade interests. When others go to war, it's not there to wage war. And so that was the second one. And both of these statuses could only exist because of the third kind of neutrality, which was what I call occasional neutrality, which is the choice that had to be made when any state went to war with any other state. All the other neighbors and other states in the world actually formally either declared their neutrality or were neutral de facto because they didn't go to war as well. And it's that reality that there were so many countries repeatedly through the 19th century that did not go to war when others did, that kept war contained to usually no more than two great powers, that you get this age of neutrality and with it the framing of more and more rights and obligations. What were these laws of neutrality and these agreements that started emerging in the 19th century and how do they work? the laws of neutrality were increasingly written down and agreed upon uh, between states. So the Declaration of Paris in 1856, after the Crimean War, declared that privateering is illegal. And so that has become a law of war. At the Hague Peace Conference of 1899 and 1907, you get these rules about territorial integrity. A belligerent cannot move their troops into neutral territory If they do, then the neutral must intern those troops and take away their armaments. Uh, Neutral countries cannot be spaces for espionage, and a neutral government must do everything in its power to prevent espionage being conducted on its territory. Aeroplanes, when aeroplanes become a thing, belligerent aeroplanes can't fly over neutral airspace. If they do, the neutral can shoot them down. So these laws all stand today, these these laws Mm -hmm. in some form. Yeah. Yeah, and so they're still contested because law is always, you know, flexes Mm. with the changing times and the needs of the governments in the international space at the time. But they're there and they're written down and they can't be changed. The other law that's really significant in all of this is uh, international humanitarian law, which was enabled in the 19th century by neutral agreements to provide aid in time of war. So you, when you get the establishment of the Geneva Conventions in 1864, which effectively say all wounded have a right to care on a, in a battlefield, so it doesn't matter whether it's an enemy or a neutral, you must give care to a wounded person. That effectively is embodied as a law of neutrality because the medical personnel who provide that care were neutralised. And so in that sense, the law is also about protecting neutral institution, neutral functions in war that are so important to reducing its suffering, which is really, really perhaps the most important duty of neutral communities and one that we're also seeing coming out in, in, in play right now in Ukraine as well. So what advantages, if any, did neutrality give states who declared themselves neutral in a conflict? And can you give us some examples? I guess what I really should just say is that neutrality is very much a tool of power. So if you are a small state, if you declare your neutrality, your primary aim is to defend yourself, protect yourself, protect your sovereignty, make sure you continue to exist when very powerful states go to war with each other or at your borders or and so forth. So in many ways, it's a defense mechanism. But in terms of pragmatics, if you're the British Empire, superpower of the 19th century, and the French and the Italians and the Austrians are squabbling over bits of Southern Europe, 
in the late 1850s, early 1860s. And you have no interest in going to war in Europe. And you don't. So there's a war in 1859, and it's part of the Italian Wars of Unification. You can, if you defend and protect and uh, adhere to your neutrality laws and you proudly proclaim your neutrality as a humanitarian act, and you send help and aid to suffering and you report on the war and people are amazed and disgusted at the violence of the war, then your interests are served. The French is a rival economic empire. The Italians are problematic. The Austrians are an empire. While they're preoccupied spending their money making war with each other, you can keep your trade going, you can fund them, you can invest, you can send them military materials. Can't send them ships, but you can send them pretty much anything else. And you can keep your empire going. You can keep sending settlers to New Zealand, Australia. Gold rushes are on at about the same time. Your access to the world continues as long as you accept a basic set of rules. And the belligerents, the warring powers, accept a basic set of rules, which is they won't interfere with you unless you are breaking those rules. So there's everything to gain. Hmm. Likewise, If you go to war, you have everything to lose because powerful rivals who are neutral can take over trading opportunities. Is there an example of that? Yeah, so in the Crimean War, the United States stayed neutral, for example. It takes the British and the French several months to join the war. It's a war that was fought between the Russians and the Ottoman Empire to begin with, but they joined for all sorts of reasons. Despite the fact that both the British and the French are really concerned about the costs of this war for their economic and imperial interests, despite the fact that they put all these safeguards in place, they were still at war, which carried risks, including the risk of the Russian Navy intercepting their ships. So they actually lost a lot of economic access to, say, the Americans, who at that stage were expanding through the Pacific. And one of the things that always strikes me as really significant about the Crimean War is that it comes at the same time as what is called the opening up of Japan to the United States. Captain Perry sails into the closed borders of the Japanese uh, empire at this time. And it's so it's not the British or a European empire that opens up this relationship with the Japanese, but the Americans. And this is in part because the British and the French are are distracted with war in Europe. So there is these costs to war, which makes you you become more insular, you focus on on security interests, you have to uh, prioritize the fighting of the conflict. And so that opens up opportunities for other states to to take over interests. Just to sum up there, really what you're saying is that these moments in the 19th century where these great powers were declaring themselves neutral actually gave them um, more ability to kind of colonise other parts of the world to make their empires bigger and more forceful and, and more violent. Absolutely. Crimean War is the only war in which Britain ends up going to war with other great powers. After the Crimean War, there is a shift to neutrality in its relationships to Europe. So it tries to absolutely keep out of uh, warfare with any of its imperial rivals or within Europe itself. Other than that, it's doing a huge amount of diplomatic pressuring in situations of crisis. Meanwhile, that really does mean that it can focus on expanding its other interests and using its military force to quell resistance, uprisings, acquire territories and colonize the world. And in many ways, I would argue that British power was dependent on this policy of neutrality in Europe. What looks like a century of peace, the Pax Britannica, peaceful Britain, was Pax Britannica, because of a foreign policy of choices to not go to war with certain kinds of rivals and to therefore enable it to go to war with smaller, easily conquered uh, territories and peoples and expand its empire. But also it had a huge impact on its informal empire, so its ability to open up markets and invest in infrastructure around the world and um, create agreements with 
suppliers of materials and give loans to dependent groups and governments and communities. So the wealth of the British Empire grew on this kind of no war in Europe or as little war in Europe as possible and expansion overseas. So obviously that changed. And then in the early 20th century, there was this huge world war. So how did World War I change what it meant to be neutral and the parameters of that? So you have a century where whenever there is a crisis, great power neutral governments interfere, try to resolve it by having a conference or behind the scenes diplomacy and so forth. In July 1914, that changed and there are all sorts of reasons for that. And that meant that by the 5th of August 1914, when Britain declares war, on Germany, ostensibly because Germany invaded the neutralized state of Belgium, that you have a complete shift in the way things have done. There is an understanding and it's registered across the world that the invasion of Belgium was such a shock because it breached this idea that had become kind of norm, established um, in expectation that neutralized states and neutral small powers didn't have to fear being invaded by a military power. And that moment when the Germans decide to move their troops through a neutral country, that is what changed the way in which international society worked. How did that shift change things after the war? What, what happened? So what happened during the war is that it made it almost impossible for other neutrals to stay neutral long term. And as the war became more invasive economically and, and so forth, you get this tumbling effect where all sorts of countries have to go to war. Either they're invaded or they're forced to join or they become part of a world at war because they're in part of an empire that's at war with another empire. And the one great power that managed to stay neutral for much of it is the United States. And the United States did what all neutrals do, which is make the most of that neutrality. And so the Americans funded, invested, sold goods, made huge profits on the suffering, on the war that was being fought between the great empires with the metropoles in Europe. And so what ends up happening is that by the time we hit 1917, when the United States goes to war with Germany, the expectation that neutrality is something that states do and will be protected and is a useful part of functioning of international society, stabilizes things, keeps the peace sort of thing, has gone. And so after World War I, you get the League of Nations, and after World War II, you get United Nations, you get principle of collective security. A different way of trying to keep the peace trying to avoid going to war with each other has to be done through this formal institution. And that's the system that we've had pretty much since 1918 in some way, shape or form. And kind of today with the invasion of Ukraine, we're kind of at the cusp of, I think, a change, a shift in the way people see things being done I see the invasion of Ukraine very much like contemporaries in 1914 saw the invasion of Belgium as, whoa, that shouldn't have happened. Something happening here that is unexpected and it is changing the way we think about how things are done, why things are done in those ways. So that's why, aside from the violence of it, the suffering of it, it's such a confronting conflict. What lessons are there from your work and your historical understanding of the concept of neutrality for the the war um, that's happening now, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and what the world is doing? My greatest concern about the moment in Ukraine is that it is important to stop and pause and just reflect on the responsibilities that we all have to what's happening, because this is not just a war that is happening somewhere else in which everyone else is standing by. Neutrality, non-belligerent, is never about standing by doing nothing, head in the sand. And when we classify the rest of the world as not taking part, we're actually misidentifying much of what's going on because we collectively, our governments collectively, are responsible 
for trying to bring this to a close. And so behaving responsibly is really significant because there are millions of people's lives at risk, not least the risk of expanding a conflict unnecessarily to include more countries. Okay, well, thank you so much, Marta. Your insights have been really valuable to helping us understand this concept of neutrality. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. We're taking a quick pause here to ask you a little favour. We want to know what you think about our podcast. The Conversation Weekly launched in February 2021, and this is our 64th episode. We hope if you're a regular listener, you've learned something along the way. Whether you listen every week or if this is your first ever episode, we'd love to hear what you have to say about the show. Think it's good, think it's bad, any comments, critiques, anything. We're doing a short listener survey, and we've got a link to it in the show notes. It shouldn't take you more than about five minutes. Thank you, and now back to the episode. After hearing about the history of neutrality and the reasons why countries choose to be neutral, I want to know more about India's case today. Yeah, India really is an interesting example of this balancing act. And it's a balancing act between Russia and the West, both of which India has a close relationship with. So let's pick up with Swaran Singh again. India's relationship uh, with Russia and United States are both uh, very critical for India and also very thick and very wide relationships. Relationship with former Soviet Union was long-standing and the uh, Soviet Union has stood by side of India on several very critical issues. And over years and over decades, uh, Russia, now the successor state, has come to be not just the supplier of defense uh, technologies and equipment for India. Uh, it used to, at some stage, supply 70% of India's defense equipment. But it has also moved since then from license production to joint research and development. But at the same time, last two decades have seen India diversifying its procurements and partnerships in defense cooperation, which means India's procurement from Russia on, on defense equipment has come down from 70 to almost 49% now. And that diversification is part of India's engagement in last 20 years with the United States and its friends and allies. So if you look at last 20 years, we will notice that large number of defense contracts have been signed with countries like Israel, France, uh, United States. Uh, and in that sense, uh, that could be seen as a new defense cooperation, though relationship, which is particularly people to people, has always been much stronger with United States and its friends and allies uh, over decades. And in that sense, even today's uh, figures for the trade, for example, put India's trade with United States usually between 130 to 150 billion dollars compared to 8 to 10 billion dollars trade with Russia. So both have their own uh, niche areas, uh, which uh, makes India engage them very, very clearly, except that the uh, United States has an expectation of India kind of towing the American line, which uh, I think it expects uh, likewise from its European allies very often. But just like European allies have stood up and have followed their own national interest, uh, so does India follow its national interests. And therefore, I think there is a little bit of a uh, pull and push that uh, happens between India's uh, relationship with the United States. So it's a different kind of uh, relationship, but both relationships are equally critical for India. And that's how India has continued to maintain a certain amount of balance in these two relationships. So th this balance, as you say, is really important. Um, and you, you talked about kind of weighing up the costs. Are there costs to India of being neutral in this conflict? I think the most visible cost, uh, particularly in the context of Ukraine in crisis, uh, is uh, once in a while uh, tempers uh, betraying emotions, uh, particularly from some of the American senior officials, uh, including at some stage President Joe Biden. U.S. President Joe Biden has said that India was an exception among Washington's allies with its quote-unquote shaky response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, Russia also has expectations from India. Uh, and then, you know, Russia sometimes says uh, very openly that countries that are not supporting Russia will have uh, costs attached to their uh, not just uh, opposing various UN re resolutions, but even abstentions on those resolutions. Uh, but as I mentioned, India is constantly trying to maintain balance in these relationships. And I think over time, these countries begin to appreciate also India's balancing act. 
to give you a simple example the india is an enormous importer 85% of uh, crude oil india imports uh, for consumption from outside russia is an old friend russia is offering up to 30% discount on uh, oil for india because of sanctions being uh, sort of raised from uh, us uh, and its friends but india is not procuring india is not going whole hog to buy oil from russia india is procuring oil from russia has moved up from 1% to now almost 3% so india could easily go ahead and buy 10% 12% from russia but perhaps we are trying to make sure in india to keep it under the radar so that could be i guess an advantage for india it could economically take advantage of russian gas and oil exports if it wanted to indeed i would agree with you just i mentioned that there are costs and sometimes tempers betraying from india's interlocutors from these countries there are also benefits of course Uh, and other than the fact that india is beginning to increase its procurement of commodities like uh, coal oil and other things from russia it much more has uh, advantage india in terms of intangibles where india is uh, if you look at the uh, last 6 to 8 weeks the kind of foreign uh, leaders are traveling to new delhi uh, it has definitely makes india far more visible and engaged player in ukrainian crisis british prime minister boris johnson will be in india for a two day visit russian foreign One minister sergey lavrov is in new delhi to spend japanese prime minister fumio kishida is in new delhi with the visit of britain's foreign secretary we are currently having in delhi something uh, called raisina dialogue which is like devos forum at a relatively maybe smaller stature but we have about 17 foreign ministers including seven european foreign ministers in delhi three former prime ministers so uh, all i'm saying is that this increasing expanding engagement of india in the context of ukrainian crisis is a reflection of india's uh, greater visibility and i would even dare say maybe credibility in its contributions that it can make to global trends uh, and particularly on ukrainian crisis that's advantage it one element you've mentioned that you, you touched on is is sanctions now obviously in this kind of a conflict where there are kind of almost unprecedented sanctions being um, imposed on russia by the west how does india navigate that such a uh, hyped up uh, campaign of imposing severe and unwearable sanctions on russia cannot be without impact on india's uh, foreign policy choices uh, definitely it has challenges for india but let me also say that uh, from the very beginning in principle india has been against uh, any unilateral or outside united nations framework uh, sanctions being imposed by any country on any other country so that's a principled position that india has had now as an academic i have also studied the uh, sanctions regime over period of time and i uh, believe that sanctions uh, have almost never worked in any of the situations even when it comes to really pariah small uh, weak states like north korea or uh, myanmar in india's neighborhood uh, indeed sometimes sanctions have been counterproductive uh, because uh, there are always leeways and uh, there are other counter new alignments that can be developed Uh, domestically uh, nations uh, could find uh, alternative resolutions uh, how to overcome sanctions impact uh, in any case uh, the sanctions have long term impact they don't uh, impact uh, president putin's uh, uh, firepower on the ground as we speak uh, so i think it's symbolic and it has a certain restraint on india's choices no doubt uh, but india has also been at the same time uh, been able to procure oil and coal and other things and even talk about a rupee ruble swap India is reportedly looking to open alternative payment channels with Russia to overcome this uh, difficulty of uh, dollar being the currency of transactions uh, running through certain institutions which are under those sanctions and, and likewise India's neighboring country China also uh, is working on similar issues how are the debates playing out within India on India's neutral stance on the war and where are the different political camps kind of falling out on this uh, i think you're familiar with India uh, having a whole spectrum of uh, ideologies political parties and views uh, sometime we joke that uh, three indians would have four views because by the time third spoke the first said i've changed my mind uh, so definitely there are uh, very very robust debates uh, but let me also uh, give a, a kind of a overarching interpretation to say that Uh, foreign policy has largely uh, remained uh, an area of consensus uh, 
of course ukraine uh, crisis and india's uh, uh, policy posturing towards uh, this issue has been in debate so you can actually see there is uh, right left and center kind of views some of the commentators would like to see india aligning more closely with the united states others would like to see india aligning much closely with uh, russia there are uh, connections being made with the china being sort of emboldened because russia is being emboldened so those kind of debates definitely exist in india but i think the underlying factor here uh, is how india sees itself as uh, not india but international monetary fund reports are saying that india is going to be the fastest growing economy on the planet among big economies what i'm saying is that there is a debate in in the country on ukrainian crisis but the focus being a positive proactive on india as an emerging economy and therefore emerging power uh, i think overrides uh, some of these domestic divisions to say that india must play a significant role and uh, some of the commentaries would even go to the extent of saying that india could utilize uh, india sees uh, ukrainian crisis not only as a challenge but opportunity and potentially ukrainian crisis could become an inflection point of india being seen as a much serious player at global level is there anything that could shift india's neutral stance one way or other is there anything that would happen in the war that would change this proactive neutrality into taking a firmer side either way i am really uh, happy you asked me this question because i would have missed uh, this very important element of our discussion i call it proactive neutrality because it has constantly been evolving if you look at the statements and speeches coming out of india on ukrainian crisis even if you look at the speeches made in various united nations uh, discussions india began by talking of india being concerned then it moved to say india deplores then india started saying that we need to have respect for international law and united nations charter then india said india wants to ensure that the sovereignty of country is respected territorial integrity is ensured so you can see india's momentum and finally on buka india said india would like to see an independent investigation being made on the massacre in buka recent reports of civilian killings in busha are deeply disturbing we unequivocally condemn these killings and support the call for an independent investigation so there is constant proactive evolution of india's stance on on what india sees uh, happening on the ground and how india wishes to respond to the ukrainian crisis and that makes it very dynamic it's not neutrality which says we have nothing to do with ukrainian crisis it's not a neutrality that says oh we have a fixed stance and we are stuck on it we are not going to change it it's been constantly evolving and it could evolve further only thing is we all hope that ukrainian crisis come to an end as soon as possible because it impacted the immediate country of course very very badly but it has global impact and india is part of that world and india gets impacted too absolutely we all hope it it does draw to an end um, as soon as possible so thank you so much for your time today um it's been wonderful talking with you thank you so much i very much understand that point that india's position might change war changes very much like what happened to the us in both world war 1 and world war 2 yeah and india is remaining neutral right now but who knows how the course of the war might change its decision there are other countries which are traditionally neutral which are now considering actually joining nato say finland and and sweden you can read some articles by marcha abenhus and swaran singh on the conversation We'll put links to those articles and to some further reading on the issue of neutrality in this episode's show notes. That's it for this week. Thank you to all the academics who've spoken to us for this episode and to Namita Kohli in Delhi for her help too. Thanks to the conversations Finley McDonald and Stephen Kahn, to Alice Mason for our social media and to Soraya Nandi for help with our transcripts. You can find us on Twitter at tc underscore audio, Instagram at theconversation.com, or email us, podcast at theconversation.com. Don't forget to sign up for our free newsletter. It's a good one. And also don't forget to complete our listener survey. You can find a link to that in the show notes as well. The Conversation Weekly is co-produced by the wonderful Men Marwani and fantastic Gemma Ware, with sound design by the excellent Eloise Stevens. Our theme music is by Nita Sarl. That was Dan Marino. I'm Gemma Ware, and thank you for listening.